Welcome to IDF TV. My name is Frank Junkius and I'm from the Oracle Data Loss and IDF Stock Management Team. In this session, we talk about PC integration in Oracle IDF System Components. And before we dive into the topic, let's have a look at the IDF System Components architecture. As you can see from the picture, there are three main components in IDF System Components as a framework. These are entities, view objects, and application modules. And when you design them, then you mostly configure XML metadata. And at runtime, this XML metadata will use one of the framework classes that we provide with a product. So either the entity input class, or the view object input class, or an application module input class. As you can see later on when we talk about PSQL integration, the key advantage of using AD system components is that it can override the default framework behavior because the default framework behavior is that entities read from tables, view objects query through entities but against tables using SQL, and then application modules expose view objects as a contract, as the data model to the application developer. Now, let's look into how can you make that work with a Pure SQL API. On this slide, Basically, the first point here is that for the use case we're discussing here, we just assume that ADF systems component will read through a SQL statement against the table or view. So that means that the query is against the database table, but that the update, delete, and the uh, insert behavior, the create behavior, is something that you want to be handled through stored procedures. This is, if you watch the first episode of this PSQL integration talk, this is comparable to the PSQL API, where we protect our database table infrastructure with PSQL stored procedures, so that we have kind of a consistent access, no matter what the client is, and one of the client will be ADF Business Components. What you do to make that work with PSQL is, you need to override one of the framework methods, and this framework method that you need to override is do DML. And though we don't go into any kind of technical detail here in this talk, you can read this up in the Fusion Developer Guide. So do DML is one thing you need to override, and then more optionally, you want to override the uh, find by primary key or find by key or the locking behavior. It could be that your stored procedure not only updates a single table, which is kind of uh, wrapped by PSQL, but also maybe updates another table, in which case the locking for the row that needs to be updated needs to be performed on that table as well. But this is all up to your stored procedure. By default, the locking behavior would be against the table that you're working with. So let's have a look how you do this. Well, coming back to the architecture view, now just looking at the entity object here, we do have an entity object that reads from an XML file, which is the configuration that you create at design time, and actually you have an entity base file. So that's the runtime file that is used. Now, by default, I mentioned this is the file that comes with ADF Business Components. However, you can create your own version of it, in which case you have a custom implementation file that we recommend you doing anyway. Even if you don't have to put anything in there, it's a very good preparation to make your application future safe. Maybe in the future you want to add some logging, all kind of stuff that then you can put into your custom class. To create a custom implementation file, what you would do is you would just go to the entity editor, choose the Java option, and then create an entity input class. This class then will be created in your project, as part of your project, and there will be a reference added to the XML file that says, hey, we're no longer using the base class that comes from Oracle, we use our custom implementation class. And of course, your custom implementation class should extend the base class so that you're not losing on any functionality. Have a look at this slide here. So this now shows the overridden do DML operation. The overridden do DML operation actually will call a stored procedure for the insert, delete, and for the create situation. So whenever you create a new entity, this entity will actually call out to a stored procedure that you specifically provided to handle the create new row on new entity behavior. If you paid attention to the header of the slides that I'm talking um, about right now, 
uh, you see that it's saying the no reuse option. Now, why is that? Well, this code that we're seeing here that we're looking at means that we're creating a custom info file for every entity that we need to have SQL integration with, right? Now, this means that the code that we're writing is in readable for every entity. So that most likely means we're hard coding the names of the stored procedures that we use for insert, update, and delete. Now, this makes it not reusable because you're rewriting it over and over again uh, with all kind of different stored procedures. However, the base code, the what we call um, the boilerplate code, is always the same. You hook into the transaction, which is passed in as an argument, and then you invoke a stored procedure on it. And you pass arguments, which you read from the attributes of the entity. There's a reuse implementation of this as well, which we will refer to as the advanced implementation. Because there might be that you have a reason to implement more view SQL integration, could be that you have a lot of view SQL to integrate, and that the use of the view SQL table API is something that you use throughout your application infrastructure. So for that reason, you want to make it easy. You want to make sure that developers have it easy implementing it and don't have to rewrite all the boilerplate code that is just a repeating work that is time consuming and maybe not even worth doing. So the reusable approach, as you can see on this slide here, is that you create a PLSQL base class. As we recommend you to create a base class for the framework classes in general, you can have one that just deals with PLSQL methods. And you see on this picture, there are two base classes that we recommend you to build. One is for the entity implementation, and the other is for a class that we haven't talked about yet, which is the entity def import class. So that's the definition of the entity class. And this class is needed for the generic approach to allow you to parameterize the entity use. So you have a base class which knows how to call stored procedures, so that has basically the do DML operation overridden, and it needs to know which store procedure to call, and it needs to know which attribute to inject as an argument. Now this all needs to be parameterized. And that's definitely something that most of the developers understand. Take some prefabricated work and parameterize it and make it use uh, and work within their own project. So before I show you some of the screenshots that we prepared for this training, just to show you what we mean by this implementation class, let me show you some slide about what the origin is of this reusable approach. It basically comes from a blog written by uh, former Oracle employee Avon Federman, and he called it extreme reusability, and he did this as a presentation initially for the Enterprise Mythology Group. So let's have a look at the base idea and the base concepts here. So looking at this slide, as I mentioned, the base implementation of the solution comes from Avon Federman, and he still has this on a blog and the block, as you can see, is from 2008, but hey, any component didn't change on this matter too much, so still that is a valid point of truth there. The idea here is that instead of writing custom entity objects for each use of stored procedures, you would leverage one entity base class, an entity def pay, um, base class, that developers later then can parameterize with the name of a stored procedure and the name of attributes that needs to be passed as value arguments to the stored procedure to work. The entity def input class actually loads the properties. And I don't know how familiar you are with ADF business components, but on the entity level and on the attribute level, you basically can configure custom properties. And custom properties would allow you to extend the number of attributes that an entity has with your own properties and your own attributes and then, of course, these attributes need to be read into the framework, and this is what the entity def input class is doing. So the entity def input class is a singleton that describes or helps describing to the entity and the set of attributes at runtime. So basically, that is what definitely is a need for the reusable implementation, and this is what we call it more advanced because here's the second class that we have to build. So this is a screenshot of using view sql as a table api and this is the entity uh, configuration now you double click on your entity definition in this case it's a departments.xml file that i pretend 
to be uh, protected by PLSQL API. And you go to the general setting and then you see there is a header called custom properties and you click on the green plus icon and choose a non-translatable property. Why? Because there's no need to translate it. It's just an attribute that you're adding. You're not uh, adding a label or something that would be needed to be translated. So non-translatable property and this then creates the property and then you give it a name and this name obviously is something that the entity dev impl class predicts. So that is like in my case here, delete proc for delete procedure, insert proc for insert procedure and update proc for update procedure. And then what the um, application developer that is consuming the uh, ready-made reusable PLSQL implementation is providing uh, is just the name of the package name and the procedure name. And then because of the custom framework classes that you can read up about on Avram's blog, um, this will actually make sure that you do the ML operation exactly knows what to call. Now this is just to prepare the entity with the name of the stored procedures. So let's have a look at the attributes as well. Now for the attributes, there are kind of two types of information required to pass into the stored procedure. First of all, the order in which attributes show on an entity may not be the order in which the values need to be passed to the stored procedure as an argument. So what you want to do is you want to provide an index. So here we do have an insert index for this attribute. If this attribute was used with the um, delete as well, if there's some sort of special treatment that you need to do that requires you to pass an attribute value as an uh, insert argument, then you could have another one which might be a delete index so that the def impl class would know now which of the attribute names needs to be passed with uh, in which order to the stored procedure. And the second type of information that you provide with this is that if there is no custom property defined on an attribute, obviously that attribute is not part of the stored procedure call. You see, it's a little bit of work you would have to do ahead of time just to get heads around. And once you have this entity impl class and entity dev impl class created, you actually are ready to share that in a native library for every of your developer to use and just to parameterize things. All right, so what was it all about? This second talk about PSQL integration with ADF business components or slash ADF is about how to work with the PSQL table API. And as I said before, there's a lot of pointing out that we're doing here. We're not really showing you some sort of source code, but you can read this up. The source code is available in the Fusion Developer Guide. And even for this uh, configuration, we do have an example on how to use custom properties in that developer guide. But however, I recommend you following the link to the blog that Avon wrote, just to have a read up on what extreme reusability can do for you in ADF business components. When would you use this PLSQL generic classes, reusable classes over the non-reusable case? Well, obviously, if you have quite a lot of PLSQL or if the team that you're working on is not all well skilled with Java and Java knowledge or maybe ADF business component knowledge. Now, if you have people coming from a declarative development background, they all know how to use parameters to tweak a specific behavior on a component. Now, for this kind of use case and for this kind of teams that you're working in, um, that's a full recommendation to go with a reusable approach. Also keep in mind that Always look out in ADF Business Components for implementation code that you reuse more than once because that is a clear indication that that needs to go one up in the hierarchy of inheritance stack on ADF Business Components, be it in a superclass or be it in a library. And last but not least, and I have to say that, please use PLSQL by uh, exception. If you have to, yes, feel free to do so but ADF and ADF Business Components is not a runtime container for PLSQL. That means there's a framework behavior that you have to override and you do this in the DML and you see that you're kind of working against the nature of ADF BC. So if you have a reason to use PLSQL, feel free and follow this approach of the PLSQL API or as we will see 
in the next recording where we talk about how to read from a stored procedure or a stored function in Office 6 to query in the database. However, use it by exception. Thank you.